welcome to the Fisher Protocol, the show where saying the Who is the greatest rock and roll band of all time is not subjective, but everything else is. Please take a quick second to like, subscribe, and share us with your Who-minded friends. The Who is a passion of ours. This is more of a personal journey and no money is made from these videos. So liking and subscribing lets us know that we're not alone in Who-land. Constructive feedback is always welcome, either in the comments below or you can follow me as I spout Who-related content, sometimes fairly snarky, on Twitter. <laughs> And Instagram at Fisher Protocol. Um, I am Ethan. I am being joined today by my best who friends, Tom and Betts. We do not claim to be experts, just three fans who like to talk about the greatest rock and roll band of all time. And that's the Who. How's it going, guys? It's going. It's going. Really? <laughs> it's going well. It's doing well. Um. So uh, last week we had a conversation about um, finally doing a John Entwistle solo album i believe bet said she wanted to do whistle rhymes and i was like that's great let's not start where you think the best album is because we me and tom did that with quadrophenia and i think we both think that was probably we probably would have done something else first um so i suggested uh or someone suggested one of us suggested rigor mortis sets in that was not me <laughs> that, that, that was me. <laughs> you okay um well you yeah, bets i take it back um <laughs> Uh, I hope not... you're happy with yourself, Tom. Yeah, I, <laughs> I am. Um, I thought Betts was going to be the great defender. It seems Tom's going to be the great defender here. I, yes. I, I'm not going to harp on it. I just want to get right into it. Um, let me read some things. This is uh, John and Whistle's Rigor Mortis Sets In. Um, it was released in 1973 between uh, May and June, depending on which source you're going with. Um, it was recorded between October and November 1972. Um, John's third album is a tribute to 50s rock and roll, um, and it was made for fun, and um, it's a tribute to 50s rock and roll, but, you know, uh, I don't remember when Crocodile Rock came out, probably around the same time, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Kind of the same vibe. Um, overall, really quickly, Tom, what do you think? Uh, I think this is more of a nostalgic thing for me than anything else. I remember finding this album somewhere in a used CD bin, God knows when, a kajillion years ago. And I was like, oh, well, I like The Who, and there's John Entwistle, so let's listen to this thing. And um, yeah, it, it gave me a good chuckle. It's been a year since I've listened to this album. Bats overall, you? Well, um, you know that I will never bag on this man that. I, I, the, he's my favorite member of the Who's, the best dressed, best looking, best musician. I don't like this record, and I, <laughs> I had a I had a moment to listen to it for a second time this morning, and I'm like, you know, I'm not starting my day mad, so <laughs> I'm gonna listen to it again. This was not for me. This album was not for me. It wasn't uh, made for me. <laughs> when was the first time you heard it? Actually. The very first time I heard the entire thing was on Sunday when I streamed it on YouTube. I, I knew a couple of the songs on it because I had that anthology disc, um, but I would fast forward them to get to the Mad Dog and Too Late the Hero stuff. So I, I knew what was on it, and I had the opportunity about 20 years ago to buy it on, on LP, and I didn't because I, I knew what was on it. So it, it's <laughs> not, this album was not made for me. Um. <laughs> But it was made in Japan. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I uh, I never really listened to it. I bought it on vinyl when we knew we were going to do it. I found a nice copy for like $7 on eBay. As you all know, it was delivered to uh, the ground under my mailbox. <laughs> it was just the mailman knew what was on it. He knew. <laughs> he knew. Um, and I'm glad I got it. I My big, uh, you know, John was a solo um exploration came probably 97 98 something like that and i really got into like um what are we doing here uh you know my size uh things like that too late the hero um which is a whole other conversation um yeah. so this is the first time i really dove into it i definitely had heard the my wife before um i'm more with bets on this um on this um but tom is going from a nostalgia point of view let's it's like Kraft macaroni and cheese. Is it really <laughs> Sometimes good it hits cheese? right. Yeah. Um, Does it tickle the nerve? Yes. So, like, 
I'll read some of this uh, later. I don't want to be too much of a dead horse here. Uh, let's do uh, Give Me That Rock and Roll. It's the opener. Yep. Reasonably 50s things going on here. Not strongest for me. Yeah, I think it's just like a straight, straight ahead, forward rock and roll song. Uh, nice bass presence, though, and some good horns. Um, nice little fun sax solo. Uh, but again, it's shallow. Uh, but we know that, and we're going to set the standard here for the rest of the album, how it's going to go. <laughs> Bet? Uh, it, yeah, it, it just doesn't do it for me. Um, there was so, I mean, I know there was a 50s revival with American Graffiti and everything. I just think that, like, there were bands that just kind of did it better. It just, I don't know. It, I don't. Like, okay. Okay. So. Um. <laughs> Yeah, and, and if we all feel like that, I'm going to go to the next song really quickly. Um, okay. I think definitely, you know, because I really don't want to sit here and just like bag on, yeah. bag on it for like however long. So, you know, it might be pretty quick because, you know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but it does need to be said. I'm going to take a step back on certain songs, but if there's a really high or low point, I'll say something. Mr. Bassman is like the lowest point on the record it for me. It is, uh. it is not <laughs> great. Uh, it's not necessarily bassy. Um, no. I mean, what he's singing about, um, it really made me like wish I was listening to Seaside Rendezvous by Queen. I don't know if you guys know that song, yeah. Off a Night at the Opera. Yeah. Um, I mean, that song does the things right that this song does does fairly poorly. Yeah. Yeah. There's a little earworm in it, but for me, but other than that, mm -hmm. no, it's not a great song. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Tom, your favorite. Do the dangle. So. It is. It's one of my favorites. It's cheesy as shit, uh, rock and roll song. Um, but I think it just uh, it it highlights John's sense of humor. Uh, you know, it sounds one way, and when you listen to the lyrics, it's actually one you know a different way. Um, yeah, that last verse, of like you know, you know, now you're down da dancing on air. It's you know, do the dangle or whatever. Oh, it's hilarious. Again, cheesy, dumb, but I'll take it. Um, Beth, did I ask you about Dangle? It's already out of my mind. I don't think we talked about it, no. Did you want to? <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm with Tom on this one. Um, this is where you get to see the sense of humor. Now, I don't know if um, <clears throat> if you were going to mention this or not, but you know that this album caught a ban from the BBC, like right out of the gate. And I would assume it's because do the dangle was on there, you know, oh, being yeah. like it is. Um, but yeah, it, it got, it got banned. <laughs> All right. So this is from Wikipedia. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if you guys looked at that page for this album. Yeah. I did. Rigor Mortis said it had a tough launch due to its title and cover art. BBC Radio refused to play the album and banned it, ironically, in part due to the influence of DJ Jimmy Seville, who just suffered a death in his family. Um, I'm not going to talk about Jimmy Seville here. You guys can look it up if you want to, but the fact that they did anything for that dude is amazing to me, and the fact <laughs> that they didn't give this album, as not great as it is, a proper launch because of that guy yeah. is, you know... Says not, enough. not cool you know what i mean um yeah yeah i just found that part ironic and you know but yeah bbc banning all sorts of stuff including like live singing on their show so well, you know yeah. you do. uh hound dog you know a lot of this album reminded me of, i grew up with greece right so this didn't remind me of elvis so much as it reminded me of shanana's version of hound dog yeah like it's the exact same thing almost yeah. And I don't understand why they've added all this instrumentation to a song that didn't have much instrumentation when Elvis did it, you know, I think. Yeah, but, just being extra. It's just doing a, an Elvis cover, which made me think of that new Baz Luhrmann Elvis movie with the trailer pop. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's got me excited about that. But, you know, it's kind of perfunctory. And, you know, apparently Elvis was doing better songwriting on this song than John on this album than John was. So... <laughs> You know, and he didn't write it. Lieber and Stoller, obviously. Yeah. Right. Um, that's it for Hound Dog. Do you guys want to talk, say anything about Hound Dog? Nope. Nope. Okay. <laughs> all right. So now we're talking Made in Japan. All right. Um, yeah. Made in Japan is the kind of um, it's kind of 
solo 70s John Entwistle I love. It's compressed and driven by acoustic, compressed acoustic guitars. Yeah. So I really enjoyed it. Yeah, this is this is closest to what he would do normally, not the revival stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I couldn't agree more. It's that is the most proper John song you're going to hear on the album. Um, again, with the sense of humor and you know that kind of thing, he does have a pretty uh, consistent formula for these type songs, though it's. Verse one is about one thing. Verse two is about a second thing. Verse three is the silly, goofy thing. Yeah. Kind of, you know, turns it around at the end, kind of thing. So, um, again, following the formula, it's good. It's yeah, I don't know. Uh, but you can kind of see him writing, scribbling these things down very fast on a yeah. on a bass cab. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. Uh. Well, actually. I'm going to take issue with what you said, Tom, about it being the most John Lake song on the album. The most John uh, Lake song on the album is called My Wife. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so here's my notes. I'll read you my whole notes for, for, for My Wife. Why? Please tell me. Not bad, but damn. Yeah, it's definitely my least favorite version of the song. <laughs> Was there... Bets, I don't know if you did any research. Was there any kind of like uh, reason why he decided? Like a why? Yeah. I didn't find anything, but I, I kind of think like maybe this was, you know how, you know how sometimes like when Pete had that thing about where it's like, oh, well, I'm glad John and Keith are dead, but he didn't mean that. And you had to kind of put that statement through the Pete translator in what I think what he meant was to say was, I want to hear my songs the way I kind of intend my songs to sound without the rhythm section coming in and just bulldozing it. Okay. And I wonder if this version of My Wife, which is relatively sedate, I wonder if this is John thinking that kind of thing. Like, now I want to hear the song the way I want it played. It's either that or they put it on to sort of like sweeten the rest of the album. Like, oh, do you like My Wife? You know that song. Well, it's on this record, too. Maybe that's it. I, I don't know. It It feels like, I don't know kind of like dads going in the garage and, and practicing all the songs they like, you know, it, yeah. th this version of my wife is, yeah. Also it's Max of, we need a song. So I can, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Cause the whole thing is 33 minutes, right? Like the whole album is yeah. 33 minutes. Yeah. Um, it's amazing how many times I listened to this album this week, like five or six times. Uh, <laughs> um, roller skate, Kate, I, this one's fun. This one's a funny song. You know, we're going to go skating on the M1, dur, 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 you know, and it has that sort of um, that that doom sort of 50s like tell Laura I love her kind of stuff. You know, it's yeah. like a parody of that. It's it's dopey and it's funny. It's fun. it's a funny joke. It's got um, the 50s tremolo guitar in the back and just kind of strum the slow chords. And yeah, yeah I don't know. I again, I like it. One, I like that song. Um. It definitely reminds me of uh, uh, Donna by Richie Valens. Yeah. Because, of course, it starts out with the same words, I have a girl, you know. Yeah. And, um, and also, like I was saying, J. Frank Wilson and the Cavaliers, The Last Kiss, you know, uh, yeah. death in the 50s, you know. Yeah. Uh, before we graduated to Billy Joe. <laughs> Jumping off the bridge there. Um, peg leg Peggy. <laughs> Here, I'll it read sounds my... Like I'll read you my notes. I like the guitar, but this is not giving me joy. <laughs> <laughs> but she sounds like a sewing machine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's it, it's the exact same song as "Do the Dangle," but just yes. Um, Lucille's a cover, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it didn't sound very mixed well. I mean. It didn't do much for me. Boring cover of a great song. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I guess it ends out with Big Black Cadillac, which I thought was a song I liked, and I listened to it two or three more times. And there is a bass solo, which is pretty yes. sweet, which has yeah. turned down a little low. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like the song. It was, again, kind of dark and had a little story. And I don't know. I like there's a little organ in there and bass was kind of going and there's a little space solo it was okay okay well i mean anything on big black cadillac bets 
I didn't care for that bass solo, and I know that I, I know that's a bad thing to say, but I, I, part of the issue that I had was when I, I streamed it on YouTube, the whole album, it segued into Smash Your Head, and just the comparison it does, of course, obviously it doesn't set up with the compare. It doesn't compare at all. But listening to Pick Me Up and hearing that bass, and for years thinking that was like a church bell, and then realizing it was the bass. Comparing that to the bass solo in this song was like, I, nah, nah. It, it was. It just felt lazy, you know. Yeah, I, did, I don't know. I didn't say there was a good bass solo in it. I said there was. <laughs> it was a bass solo. He gave us a bass solo. He gave us a, but, John Emerson gave us a bass solo, which is kind of what we want. So I. Understand. Yeah, but um, yeah. So that's track by track. I'll just read this paragraph from uh, Paul Rees, the Ox, uh, book, really quick. Um. The producer uh, says, oh, that's John's party record. Uh, he just wanted to get out of the house, hang with people in the studio, have a laugh. It was enormous fun to do. I just don't think it was particularly a valid reason to make a record. <laughs> and then the book goes on. Released uh, the following May, Rigor Mortis sets in, came out adorned with the front cover of the Golden Age. Um, and uh, uh, that was a portent of the album's fate, that it came out with a coffin on the front since it was dead on arrival. It's and more galling for Entwistle preceding his record by a month was Daltrey's first self-titled album. Daltrey's record was polished, easy listening, and sailed to number six in the UK. Lambert and Stamp had resisted releasing Daltrey's album so soon in advance of the Who's next uh, of the next Who set. So instead, he enlisted Kerbishly to manage the project for him. In the short term, the success of his album was a boost for Daltrey. However, the fallout from it would have longer-lasting consequences for the whole band. Which, uh, I didn't read past that yet. I mean, I have it before, but not for this, and that'll be interesting to get into. Yeah. If it calls some friction there. Maybe I think I read on Wikipedia that this uh, this album cost $10,000 to make, and they had a $4,000 uh, bar tab. Yeah, and as as much as I love The Who, the excess of rock and, access of rock and roll stories are, are, are like my least favorite Who stories. Yeah. Right. Um... But that being said, I didn't mean it to be a downer of a review show, guys. Just, you know, <laughs> we're going to talk after this, and i got to get some new good John in, so we're probably going to do a good job on this. Yeah. And I just want to say this about the album cover and everything. I, there's a line, I'm going to paraphrase it, in Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. Like, this album, <laughs> our album cover has totally lied to us. This album cover totally lied to me, because that font, that cover, everything... It looks goth or metal as hell, and it's not. <laughs> and then, and then, what I liked was that, um, you know, he was like, "Oh, did you not? Did y'all not like that record? Have some more." <laughs> it oh, was is, Mad Dog, is which is a better what, record. But is that is it Mad Dog the same kind? I'm I'm bad it, on my solo early end whistle. So is, yeah, it's, it's a real fifties. Yeah, it's real. It's it's also fifties inspired, but it's it's a, it's an improvement for real. So yeah, <laughs> and the cover of that doesn't say doesn't say 50s no it just says, it has a dog <laughs> you get a poodle skirt or something in there um all right well thanks you know uh hopefully uh you know re reason why we all me and tom started this was to dig deeper into who facets we didn't know about so now i know about it um so yeah. that's a win for us we only have six subscribers <laughs> left till we get 300 subscribers if anyone is still listening to this and you're my third hundred subscriber Email me at fisherprotocol at gmail, and I will give you something. It will be out of my Who collection, or I will buy you something from the internet if I if you are the third hundred subscriber, um, or I'll make Tom do it. Um, <laughs> but that's um, thanks, guys, for seeing uh, coming, and we'll talk to you again. Bye. Bye.